It's quite easy to understand why the speech language pathologist and audiologist need to know the neurological basis of speech, language and hearing. It makes sense because speech and language originate in the brain and that the auditory component of hearing, or at least making sense of sound, again, occurs in the brain. Now the reason why this all makes sense to us is because of the work of a number of scientists and clinicians over time. And I want to focus on just two in this short lecture. The two I want to focus on are Paul Broca, or Pierre Paul Broca, who was a French physician, and also Carl Wernicke. Now we're just going to refer to them as Broca and Wernicke. Now, Broca, in around about 1861, had two particular patients who presented with language loss due to motor disorders or motor dysfunction. Now, what Broca found was he was able to isolate or localize that a particular part of the brain was responsible for this issue of not being able to produce language due to motor disorders. He identified a part of the brain, which we term Broca's area, which is the left frontal lobe. This is important. So if we were to draw it up, we've got the brain, we've got the left frontal lobe. So this blue dot here represents Broca's area. in which his patients had lesions or damage to this particular area that resulted in issues in being able to produce language. So issues with the motor activity of language. And again, he demonstrated that for most humans, this language area is localized to the left side of the brain and in the frontal lobe. Now this is important for a couple of reasons. First reason why it's important was this demonstrated to us that certain functions of the brain are lateralized meaning are on one side or another. Now this isn't with all cases, but with a lot of different functions, it is lateralized. Another particular point is that he highlighted that functional behaviors are also localized as well, meaning that you can have a patient presenting with a behavioral pathology, and this can be an indication that there is damage or a lesion to a particular localized part of the brain. Very important. So, Again, Broca's area demonstrated that lesions or damage to this particular Broca's area had a presentation of an inability or disorder with being able to produce the motor aspects of language, so language production. So termed Broca's area was also termed motor aphasia. So let's write that down. So lesions to this area produced what was called predominantly motor aphasia. We'll leave that for the time being and we'll come back to that. Let's look at this red dot here. This is our second physician, Carl Wernicke. And Carl Wernicke had patients in which couldn't understand language. So Broca had patients that couldn't produce language and Wernicke had patients that couldn't understand speech. Okay, so this is important because he highlighted that lesions or damage to, again, a localized area of the brain in the temporal lobe presented with patients that couldn't understand speech. So this is the sensory side of things now. We've got the motor with Broca's area, and now we've got the sensory for Wernicke's area, and this was termed Wernicke's aphasia. So let's first highlight that this is Wernicke's area. So this is Wernicke's area, and it was termed sensory aphasia, or Wernicke's aphasia. Now these terms have been basically superseded with some other terms. Instead of saying Broca's aphasia or motor aphasia, it's often termed expressive aphasia. So that's one thing. When it comes to Wernicke's aphasia or sensory aphasia, it's often termed receptive aphasia. So expressive now for Broca's aphasia and receptive for Wernicke's aphasia. But there's also other terms that can be used that you should be aware of. Now, aphasia, you're probably sitting there going, I'm not actually sure what aphasia means. Aphasia basically is an inability to understand language or an, or an inability to produce language. That is aphasia. But there's more specific terms that we can use. So, for example, the term agnosia. Well, agnosia is a term that means that there's an issue with uh, understanding 
uh, sensory recognition, for example. So some sort of sensory inputs coming in, you have an inability to recognize what that sensory input is. So it doesn't just have to be language, for example. So here, when it comes to Wernicke's aphasia, it doesn't have to just be language, understanding what's happening, reading a book or uh, having some auditory signal in, but it can also be individuals who have uh, this sort of agnosia could not recognize maps or objects or people's faces as well. So this is agnosia. But there's another term that we use, which is apraxia. And what apraxia refers to is um, a disorder of uh, executing motor activity. So that means an inability to be able to perform a particular motor task at will. And this is apraxia. And again, it's not just what's happening here with Broca's aphasia, but it could also have to do with movement, so walking, to, uh, again, talking, and so forth. So these are just some very important terms and individuals that highlighted speech-language pathology uh, as a brain science. So hopefully this is a nice introduction to you uh, as to why speech pathology or speech-language pathology should be investigated as a brain science, or at least as a neuroscience. Now this is an intro, we're gonna start talking about more specific parts of the brain at the cortical region and also at the subcortical region. So I hope that made sense. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email.